Really excited to see so many of you join us today. I am Rebecca Ellen, and I'm the program manager of the reserve. I'm based in our office in Beaufort when we are not working from home. And we got we have a number of staff with us here on the webinar today, and they will introduce themselves a little bit later in the presentation. Um, Okay, well, I did want to acknowledge and let Marae introduce herself. She is our current fellow, and i um, really excited to have her join us today. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm the, the cohort number one of the Davidson Fellowship for North Carolina. Thanks for coming, Marae. All right, so what are we going to do today? We are here to give you the highlights of the fellowship program, the North Carolina Reserve, and hopefully get you interested and excited about the fellowship and the opportunity to work with us here at the North Carolina Reserve. So that's going to look like a brief um, kind of high level presentation about the Margaret A. Davidson Graduate Fellowship. We're going to watch a short video about our current fellow, Murray. And then we'll give you a brief and a high level overview of the North Carolina National Estuarine Research Reserve. So you, you have a better sense of what our reserve is like here in North Carolina. Then we're gonna spend some time talking about the North Carolina management needs. So you get a sense of uh, what we've identified as priorities and, and how that might match up with some of your project ideas. Although we'll so with that, we are gonna go ahead and get started talking about the Davidson Fellowship. And the goal of this fellowship is to develop the next generation of coastal leaders. So this is a great package uh, that we feel like uh, provides many opportunities to fellows to work on projects that address key coastal management questions that may influence future policy and management strategies. So having a real impact through the work that you're doing. There's an opportunity uh, to participate in career-focused training and professional development to develop those marketable career skills for after you complete your degree. Build your professional contacts on multiple levels. And to bring universities where the students are based together with the reserves and the communities to work on those key priority issues. So the Margaret A. Davidson Fellowship is named after uh, Margaret A. Davidson, of course, um, and this is to honor her visionary work. She was um, really um, just quite a strong presence in the coastal management world, and she really had a strong belief in bringing science to inform management decisions on the coast. She did this by engaging communities and creating innovative partnerships to get things done. She provided really strong leadership within NOAA and among her substantial network to enact change in coastal communities focused on sustainable development and also climate adaptation practices. So NOAA is continuing to build her legacy by training the next generation of leaders through this fellowship and the tenets of this fellowship are built strongly on um, Margaret Davidson's beliefs. So here are a few basics about the fellowships. So within the National Estuarine Research Reserve System, we have 29 reserves. A fellow will be placed at each of the reserves for a two-year fellowship. The work of the fellowship uh, will focus on research that informs coastal policies, so that applied collaborative science approach. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And each reserve sets their own research priorities or the management needs that we'll talk more about as well. We do work closely with the fellow to make sure that the project meets the reserve needs, but also the fellow needs as well. So I just mentioned the collaborative science approach, and this is an important tenet of the fellowship program. The goal of collaborative science is to make sure that the information that's generated from the research is useful in decision making. So this requires that the end users, those who will actually use the results or products, are integrated into the research process. And this ultimately increases the trust and legitimacy of the research product. The collaborative process begins at the early stages of the project by identifying the end users and then engaging them from the project idea and development to the product development. And this can be done using focus groups, an advisory committee, or a collaborative team. The research results or products are then disseminated to those end users to ultimately inform coastal management. So I mentioned earlier that one of the primary aspects of the fellowship program is also to develop career skills, and this happens on a variety of different levels, and this is to set you up for success after completing your degree. 
So this includes mentoring and career guidance at the reserve level, so working with your host reserve and the staff there. It also includes a variety of required and optional trainings and professional development opportunities that are provided by NOAA and potentially some other partners on a wide variety of topics. This can include project management, leadership, science communication, and career planning. Another key aspect of the fellowship is building that professional network. This is something Margaret Davidson believes strongly in, and so it's a, a primary focus of the fellowship as well. And so this occurs at, at different levels. There will be the opportunity to do this at the project level with the reserve mentor and staff, other scientists, community members, and partners that are engaged through the collaborative science approach and through the work of your research. Then there's also the opportunity to connect with uh, network, the network of the fellow class. So those um, 28 other fellows that will be in the cohort um, along with the successful fellow, but also the other professionals within the reserve system at the reserves around the country and with NOAA. So lots of opportunity for network building as part of the fellowship. Integration with the reserve system is an important part of the fellowship program as well. Um, we really want the fellows to get a, a strong experience of what it is like to uh, work with and in a program such as the reserve. And so um, the way that this happens is that there is the need to maintain regular contact with the reserve mentor. There's a requirement to stay in touch with the reserve throughout the two-year fellowship, and there's a minimum requirement for engagement of six weeks per year. This can be consecutive or non-consecutive. It really depends on where the, where the, uh, where the university is that the fellow is based um, and the, the type of research that's happening. And so there's um, some flexibility in how that happens, but there is that minimum requirement. Also, it's important to engage with the reserve programs. As you hear more about the North Carolina Reserve, you'll learn more about the diversity of programs that we have and the multiple, multi, multidisciplinary nature of those. And um, that just gives the fellow more opportunity for exposure to different aspects of um, collaborative work. And then finally, the reserve system does gather as a whole annually and attendance at these meetings uh, during each year of the fellowship is a requirement. It's a great networking opportunity as well and they're also a lot of fun. So let's talk a little bit about the timeline. So the request for proposals is now available for cohort two. So this will be the second round of fellows for the Margaret A. Davidson Fellowship. The call for applications is out now. They are due December 10th. The applications will be reviewed in the early part of the year with funding recommendations made in April, and the students will be notified May to June timeframe with a start date of August 1 of 2022. So I wanted to touch briefly on applicant eligibility. I encourage you to find more detail on this in the RFP, but I really wanted to highlight that this is available for those enrolled in um, or admitted to master's or doctoral uh, programs. So please consider that there's no preference given for the type of program track you are in. Um, they are weighed equally. Let's talk a little bit about funding. So for the fellowship, um, the funding to support the fellow um, goes directly to the university with an annual budget of up to $45,000 for direct costs that can be used to cover the stipend, tuition, travel, supply, or supplies. There is additional funding available for indirect costs if that is a need based on the requirements of your university. Of this 45K, approximately 7K per year is recommended to be allocated for travel to the various meetings and conferences that the fellows are required to attend. In addition to the funding that goes to the university, each reserve receives $7,000 annually to support the work of the fellow. And so that can be how the, used in a variety of ways, how the reserves help support the fellow. But, and then there's also conversations that happen to make sure that that um, funding is utilized in a way that's best supportive of the reserve and the fellow. So lastly, I wanted to just touch on how to apply. Again, I encourage you to read the RFP for details on this, but this first bullet I wanna um, focus your attention on. 
Um, the, one of the main tenets of the fellowship is to make sure that um, management needs identified by the reserves are getting addressed. And so it's very important to take a look at those management needs and then talk with us about your project ideas to make sure that the projects that you're considering are feasible and align with the management needs. Okay, well, let's move into talking about the North Carolina Reserve. So um, we wanted to give you a better sense of who we are as the North Carolina Reserve so that as you consider applying for the fellowship, you can keep that perspective in mind. So we have four primary purposes that we work to achieve here at the North Carolina Reserve, and the first of which is to conduct research that informs coastal management. The second is increasing the understanding of coastal ecosystems, their importance, and the effects that humans have on them. We also seek to accommodate compatible traditional uses at the places that we protect. And those places protect representative coastal ecosystems here in North Carolina. So we accomplish these four purposes through three program areas. You can see them over here in this diagram. Research, education and training, and stewardship. And you'll notice that there's overlap here. And this integration of the of the various program areas is really where we um, achieve our most success by all working together, bringing our different disciplines together to achieve greater impact on the topics that we're working on. It makes us um, much more successful in fulfilling those purposes that I just reviewed. So what about those places? Here are the places that we protect. The North Carolina National Estuarine Research Reserve is a multi-component site. That means we have more than one location that's protected by the National Estuarine Research Reserve. There are four of them and they are indicated by the blue dots on your map. And I believe you can use the zoom tool on the far left hand side of your screen if you wanna zoom in on that map a little bit more closely. The national sites include Currituck Banks up here in the northern portion, uh, Rachel Carson here in the Beaufort area, and Masonboro Island and Zeke's Reserves down in the southern area. Across these four sites, we protect over 10,000 acres in the national part of the program. Our program is also responsible for the Umbrella North Carolina Coastal Reserve Program, which protects an additional six sites and 34,000 acres. Those six sites are indicated by the green dots. So the sites in North, the North Carolina Reserve Network span the breadth of coastal ecological conditions here in the state. Research for the fellowship must occur at at least one of the national sites. If you are interested in utilizing a comparative approach to address one of the management priorities, both the national and state sites are good options. And we feel like that is actually one of the strengths of our program. Um, this map also highlights our four office locations, Columbia, Manio, Beaufort, and Wilmington. We have a, a variety of different assets associated with each of those offices and the handout that focuses on the North Carolina Reserve and the fellowship that uh, Whitney will provide you access to later on uh, provides a brief review of those assets. So the reserve network in North Carolina is obviously part of NOAA's National Estuarine Research Reserve System, the network of 29 reserves across the country, which is indicated by this map here. And the goal, <clears throat> excuse me, of the national system is to have, to protect and study estuarine systems using a systematic approach to programming. So those areas I mentioned earlier and science through the methodologies and monitoring that we do. Each reserve is managed through a state federal partnership. Um, the National Estuarine Research Reserve was established under the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act, and it directs the fellowship to be implemented in that way. NOAA, our federal partner, provides the funding and national guidance and coordination on activities that happen across the network of 29 reserves. And then each state has a partner or a lead agency that manages the day-to-day -day activities of the reserves. It can be a state agency or a university. Here in North Carolina, it's the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality's Division of Coastal Management. And so that is where the reserve sits. So next, we are going to dive into our program areas, so stewardship, 
um, education, training, and research. And each of the coordinators are going to come on and introduce themselves and talk with you real briefly about what uh, their program does. And Hope Sutton is going to join us first. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Hope Sutton. I am the Stewardship Coordinator and the Southern Sites Manager for the Reserve. I'm based out of the Southern Sites Office, which is housed at the UNCW Center for Marine Science. I oversee the Stewardship Program, and I also act as the Site Manager for the four most southern sites in our program, which were Bird Island, Baldhead Woods, Zeke's Island, and Masonboro Island. The primary goal of the Reserve Stewardship Program is to manage and protect the ecosystems of the sites, to maintain the near pristine character of the sites, and provide a stable platform for the research, education, and traditional uses that occur at the sites. A wide range of activities fall under the stewardship umbrella. So the stewardship staff uh, work on a wide variety of topics, but uh, we things like documenting the natural resources and conditions at the sites, monitoring the uses and the impacts to the site resources, and developing policies and implementing strategies to address concerns. We also monitor and conduct activities related to species of interest, which can include uh, protected species or invasive and non-native species. Um, in addition, we work closely with many different types of users at our sites. We do things like engaging community volunteers in hands-on activities, providing site information to researchers and educators, and conducting outreach programs for the general public to encourage an appreciation of coastal and estuarine environments. Uh, the stewardship staff is available to answer specific site um, based questions regarding what types of natural resources occur at each of the sites, and also to provide information about logistics and site access um, for researchers and educators and other users. Um, we also, hopefully, um, are able to use the results of research, such as um, research projects that are conducted under the fellowship, to inform the management decision making for these reserve sites. So that's stewardship in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Hope. All right, next up we have education, and our education coordinator is Lori Davis. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lori Davis, and I'm the education coordinator located in the Beaufort office. The goal of the Reserves Education Program is to communicate the importance of estuaries to a variety of audiences, including school-aged kids, college students, educators, and the general public. By using the reserve sites as outdoor classrooms, we offer field trips for schools so students can learn hands-on about estuarine habitats and the flora and the fauna. These field trips are usually offered on the Rachel Carson Reserve and Masonboro Island. In addition to the field trips, classroom visits are possible at teacher's request and camps are offered during the summertime. We work with classroom teachers and environmental educators by offering professional development workshops. These are classroom and field-based programs that highlight our curricular activities and the current reserve research and stewardship projects. As Hope mentioned, we work closely with the stewardship staff to offer public programs at our sites that include guided nature hikes, boat tours, and educational cleanups and birding trips. I encourage you all to take a look at the education section of our website and check out the classroom and field activities we currently have listed. And I'll now turn it over to Whitney. Hi everyone, I'm Whitney Jenkins. I'm the Coastal Training Program Coordinator. I'm based in the Beaufort office also with Lori and Rebecca and Brandon. Um, however, the Coastal Training Program works within North Carolina's 20 coastal counties. Our goal is to deliver science-based training to decision makers to inform decisions regarding coastal resources. And when I say decision makers, I mean people like land use planners, 
um, elected municipal and county officials, state agency staff, nonprofit staff, anyone who's making a decision about how our coastal resources are being used. And we do all of our programs and partnerships with various agencies, such as the North Carolina Coastal Federation, North Carolina Sea Grant, um, our state partner, the Division of Coastal Management, and also we have academic partners that might um, present as sub subject matter experts at a training. Um, and again, we do these programs all over the North Carolina coast. Um, some of our offerings include living shoreline workshops. We also talk about low impact development, and green infrastructure, coastal hazards, um, things like that. We normally do a needs assessment to see what our audiences are interested in, and we also offer continuing education credits to real estate agents, land use planners, um, and other professionals. Another big part of my job is facilitating collaborative processes, and um, this can be for any type of project. We do this for science projects. So, for example, Brandon Puckett, our research coordinator, has a project where they're trying to use drones to manage the salt marsh. And so I am the facilitator of the collaborative process that he's using to organize that research project. But then I also work with other partners um, to facilitate collaborative processes. So, for example, in the state, we have the Natural and Working Lands Group. That is part of Governors Cooper's Executive Order 80 on climate change. And I work with that group to design a collaborative stakeholder process to get input and hear from partners about how they're implementing that initiative. So I'm happy to help answer any questions, and I'm also happy to talk with you about how we can incorporate collaboration in your science projects. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Whitney. And now we have Brandon with Research and Monitoring. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for logging in. Uh, my name is Brandon Puckett. I am the Reserves uh, Research Coordinator, so overseeing the, the Research and Monitoring Program, uh, which the primary goal of our program really is, is very similar to this fellowship, and that is to um, conduct research and monitoring um, both within the reserve sites and associated watersheds um, in a manner that advances our understanding of, of coastal and estuarine ecosystems and, and ultimately to inform uh, coastal management. And so we do this through uh, a few avenues, the first of which is our um, long-term uh, system-wide monitoring program, so acronym SWMP, which you'll hear me probably call it SWAMP um, in conversations, um, which is the monitoring of water quality, um, emergent vegetation, so think salt marsh there, as well as habitat mapping and change analyses. Um, I say that um, and, and, and want to highlight a bit that those data, should they be useful for projects you're thinking of, are available for your use. Uh, for instance, Murray is using some of our surface elevation table data as she thinks about modeling sea level rise and things like that at some of our sites. So just a resource to keep in the back of your mind as you're developing project ideas. Should it be useful, um, please uh, reach out. Um, so internally, our internal research projects, um, we conduct as a staff uh, over the last several years have generally focused on a few priority areas. Um, so estuarine shoreline management, uh, species and, and habitat restoration, uh, and resilience of, of coastal ecosystems to natural and anthropogenic stressors. Um, and we don't do that um, just by ourselves. We often partner with folks just like you all, graduate students in many cases, but also state and federal partners as well as NGOs. And then lastly, I just wanna highlight that our, our, our research staff as well as stewardship staff and others um, are here, you know, really to help facilitate research at the, the, the reserves. You know, they're intended to be living laboratories for use um, for conducting research. So um, we, we facilitate in a number of ways um, for anything from assistance with field sampling to expertise in guiding site selection and project design, um, access to reserve sites through use of um, some of our vehicles or vessels, uh, provision of data, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so those are just a few highlights of the research program. And with that, Rebecca, I think we have next slide, which is questions about our program. 
I just I hope that that overview of the reserve and the programs helped you kind of connect the dots between the requirements of the fellowship to engage with the reserve and its staff and the programs um, as now you have a better sense of what our programs do and how you might be able to leverage and and utilize those programs to conduct the work of your of your project and um, also how the staff can really serve as, as experts to help you um, navigate this, this process and think about collaborative science and the different approaches to ensure that the work and products are utilized by the end users. And since Maria is on, I just wanted to put her on the spot. Maria, I apologize in advance and see if you wanted to um, add any thoughts or perspectives or um, from your um, experience as a as a current fellow. Uh, yeah, this has been an uh, absolutely wonderful fellowship. I couldn't really ask for more. It's uh, you can work with every reserve sector that you want. Um, they're all helpful and willing to they want you to be a part of what they're doing and use their information and um, I'm working at four of the sites, both national and um, local or uh, North Carolina specific sites. So you can work at more than one and enjoy the beauty of it all. Thanks, Marie. Okay, well, if there are not any questions about the North Carolina Reserve, um, we are going to move forward and talk about the management needs that we identified. And Brandon is going to review those for us. Yeah, so um, just want to briefly highlight that the, the, the six management needs that are um, listed in the RFP in association with the North Carolina Reserve. Um, and as Rebecca mentioned earlier in the, in the first few slides, um, obviously potential fellows must address at least one of these needs um, with their proposed research to be competitive in the competition. Um, and so on the next six slides, I'll highlight these, uh, the management needs. Um, as we go through those, three, three of the six needs are, are really specific to, to, to North Carolina. Uh, three others are what we're calling regional management needs um, with the intention that the fellows would work with reserves across the Southeast region. And, and this is sort of a new model um, in response to um, fellows from cohort one suggesting that um, they desired for their research to have broader implications and applications across multiple reserves, um, as well as uh, identifying um, the, the desire to network uh, with multiple reserves. So hopefully um, these regional needs will, will help maybe address some of those desires uh, identified by the first cohort. Um, and so for one of these regional needs, North Carolina, we are the host reserve. And for the other two, um, some of our sister reserves in the Southeast are the host reserves. And I'll, I'll kind of explain how that might work uh, when we get there. Um, I should also note, I suppose, that uh, some of the management needs are intentionally broad, uh, some, whereas some of them are pretty narrowly focused. Um, and there's, there's no advantage um, whatsoever to applying under any one of the management needs over any other. Um, and, and as I go through these slides, they're, they're, they're not listed in any order of importance or anything like that. So please don't take it that way. Okay, so the, the first um, uh, the need is related to ecosystem services. Um, and, and so we know that, that habitats within the reserves um, and coastal habitats in general provide a number of ecosystem services and, and that we also know that these services are or can be impacted by you know, a number of factors. Um, but what we what we need really is 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 a, a sort of a, to quantify and better understand these services provided by reserve habitats and how these factors, um, including things like climate change, invasive species and or coastal development kind of alter the delivery of these services in a way that really can be used to inform uh, management strategies that ultimately maximize ecosystem service delivery. All right. Uh, second need we've identified relates to uh, habitat vulnerability. Um, coastal habitats at, at reserve sites and elsewhere are vulnerable to uh, climate change impacts. So think sea level rise, um, increased storminess, temperature, things like that. Um, and the vulnerability of habitats to climate change is influence, influenced by um, human activities, you know, things like 
sand placement, dredging, stormwater runoff, et cetera. Um, but it's less clear, um, you know, so how, how vulnerable the habitats are to climate change and human impacts and really the interaction between those. So we're, we're interested in, 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 in mitigating vulnerability through the evaluation of strategies to enhance habitat resilience. So that's the gist of the second management need. So the, the third need we've identified relates to dredge monitoring. So the, whereas the first two were fairly broad, this one's a little more uh, narrowly focused. Um, uh, hopper dredging uh, has, has generally been restricted to an environmental window in order to avoid, avoid uh, potential impacts with natural resources. Um, recently, the, the Army Corps of Engineers has asked for and been, been granted a, a moratorium on environmental windows for dredging North Carolina's two uh, deep draft uh, state ports at uh, Beaufort Inlet and Cape Fear River Inlet, um, which are both proximal to um, and within the watersheds of the Rachel Carson and, and, and Zeke's Island uh, uh, national sites. And so um, resource managers um, really need kind of research that uh, builds on existing studies and addresses one or more of the following knowledge gaps. Um, so that is uh, spatiotemporal patterns of ichthyoplankton abundance and, and, and composition and, and their potential interactions with dredging. Uh, secondly is uh, spatiotemporal patterns of things like staging, migration, and spawning activity of commercially and recreation, recreationally important species within the inlets um, and how that might interact with dredging. And then lastly, um, the characteristics of the sediment plume associated with dredging, which you see pictured there, um, and what the implications of that are for, for water quality, um, sedimentation of nearby habitats, and, um, and or impacts on benthic communities. Okay, so the, the fourth need here is the first of the three, what I'm calling regional management needs. Um, and so this is related to the broad topic of habitat mapping and assessment. Um, and so as part of the NEARS system-wide monitoring program, as I mentioned earlier, um, we, we've, we've mapped habitats and we've used remote sensing in, in, in many cases to, to map um, intertidal to upland habitats. Um, but what we've not really done is applied remote sensing approaches to assess, you know, quote unquote, the condition of, in this instance, intertidal oyster reefs. So going beyond just mapping their location and extent to um, looking at things like uh, maybe some demographic characteristics, et cetera, using uh, remote sensing approaches. So what we in North Carolina, as well as some of our colleagues in the Southeast are interested in is developing um, novel methods and workflows to uh, remotely assess the condition of, of oyster reefs habitat at really user defined both spatial and, and temporal scales. Um, and so this need again was, was identified and, and developed by staff from um, the, the reserves uh, in the southeast, so that's North Inlet, Winyaw Bay in South Carolina, Ace Basin in South Carolina, Sapelo Island in Georgia, and GTM in Florida. Um, again, we're the host reserve, so if you're interested in, in, in this need, um, you know, you'd contact me and we can discuss a little bit about how the regional approach uh, may work. Um, the, the fifth uh, management need is related to um, uh, monitoring applications, and again, this is a, another regional need, um, and uh, again, relating to the system-wide monitoring program, which the NEARS invests heavily in, um, and it, it's led to some, some really high-quality environmental data that is available for coastal management and, and, and policy decision-making, um, but the use of the data for these purposes could certainly be expanded. So reserves across the region really seek, are seeking a, a stakeholder-driven project that, that examines um, sort of lessons learned from relevant case studies and, and makes recommendations for enhancing uh, the relevance of the NEARS monitoring data in, in policy and decision-making. Uh, this need is being hosted by our reserve, our colleagues at GTM in, in, in the Jacksonville, Florida area with the idea that it could be done and work across uh, reserves within the region. So if, if this is a topic that interests you, um, please contact me and, and I'll initiate an introduction between you, um, myself, and, the, and the, the contact at GTM. So happy to facilitate that and, and that introduction.
Okay, and so the last need is um, relates to uh, natural resource use. Um, and again, this is the third of the, the regional needs. And so um, the provision of, of natural resources is, is a key ecosystem service. Um, yeah, and, and, but the growing human populations along the coastlines are, are putting uh, increasing pressure on uh, you know, key populations of key species. So really we need assessments of the, the ecological effects of uh, and the human dimensions of natural resource use. Think things like harvest of, of bivalves or crustaceans or finfish um, in order to implement uh, ecosystem based management. And, and so this, this uh, management need is being hosted by our, our uh, colleagues at North Inlet Winyaw Bay uh, near in, uh, near Georgetown, South Carolina, with the idea that it could be um, applied across uh, reserves within the Southeast region. And again, happy to, if this topic interests you, happy to um, initiate and facilitate an introduction with the appropriate contact at North Carolina, or at North Inlet, excuse me. I should have probably said in the introduction, um, as I before I explain the regional needs, that um, to keep in mind that that you students um, you're, you're not limited to working in North Carolina simply because your university is based within North Carolina. You are eligible to work within any uh, near across the country. So look at all of their management needs, and if any of them are really down your alley, then um, you know don't hesitate to contact them reach out to them and, and initiate conversation and see if it could be a good fit. So with, with all that said about the management needs um, associated with our reserve, um, we wanted to open it up for questions, but um, before we do that, I, I don't wanna get into the specifics of, of your project ideas and relevance to the management needs. I'd prefer that we address those questions um, within our office hour session, which um, Whitney just linked in the chat box for a sign up sheet. Session. Whitney, Hope, and myself will be there to answer all sorts of questions you might have about project ideas, et cetera. If none of those on the schedule work for your, um, your, your schedule, then please reach out to me and we can, we can set up a time to meet for sure. All right, well, if you're formulating any or um, still thinking or typing or whatnot, I, I think Whitney can, can link maybe the handout, um, which, which details and kind of highlights some of the stuff we've gone over, um, what the management needs are, what collaborative science is, um, some of the key assets we have that you may have access to um, if, if it would be useful to conduct your research, things like that. So I'd encourage you to, to take a look at that handout as well, which is linked in the chat box. Well, um, if there aren't any questions, then uh, I guess we, I just want to, on behalf of our staff, thank you all so much for your interest in the fellowship and, and for attending the webinar. Um, on the screen here are a few ways to connect with us via um, social media and the web. Uh, there's there's going to, forthcoming, there will be a, a blog post series um, on our social media that should help or could be useful as you consider um, the proposal writing process. So stay tuned for those. Um, and uh, reserve staff, I guess I'd just open up to you and, and for anything that you'd like to add before we uh, log off. Brandon, um, Alex has a question in the chat box. He has a question about SWAMP or whatever the acronym is. Yep, S-W-M-P, no A. Can you give a few examples of the data that is collected and the time span? Yeah, great question, Alex. Yeah, so um, our longest running time series is our water quality monitoring data. So that is collected uh, at 15 minute intervals and in some places goes back as far as uh, 1997, so uh, over 20 years. We do that monitoring at our Zeke's Island site, the Masonboro Island site, so down in the southern part of the state near Wilmington, as well as the Rachel Carson Reserve um, in the Beaufort area. We don't have water quality monitoring ongoing at all 10 of our reserve sites, unfortunately. Um, we also have um, uh, been monitoring uh, emergent vegetation, salt marsh vegetation, and uh, characteristics thereof, things like surface elevation tables, et cetera, um, for about a decade now. And again, we do that at those three same sites. So Zeke's Island, Mason Bro, and Rachel Carson. And that's simply because 
bandwidth thing and access our research staff is located close to those sites and our team of three just simply can't do it all at all 10 sites as much as we'd like to. Um, and then we've also done habitat mapping um, at all 10 of the, the reserve sites. So if, if, if you're interested in that, we have GIS layers, et cetera, that are available for all 10 sites. Um, using imagery from some of the sites probably 2010 and some of the sites a bit newer, um, but that details all of the um, habitats that are within the reserves, at least intertidal to upland, not much in the way of subtitle habitat mapping at, to this point. Hey, Brandon, do you want to mention what parameters swamp captures in the water quality and meteorological? Parameters? Yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, good question. Thanks, so. Hope. Uh, so, Things like so temperature, salinity, uh, pH, chlorophyll A, um, turbidity, you know, those are recorded at 15 minute intervals. Um, meteorological data, temperature, um, PAR, so uh, um, relative humidity, precipitation, things that kind of typical um, met data there. So any of all of those data are um, accessible to, to students that it, it may be of use um, for their projects. I would just add that uh, for the students, uh, for any of the project ideas you have, please reach out and ask what data we may have available because there are many more data that we have and, and models that um, we have not gone over here today. So for example, for the dredge monitoring project, there's, a, um, there's some years of data that have been collected already that could potentially be useful in um, pursuing that project idea. So I would just encourage you to ask the question um, because it's um, a challenge to go over every, every data set that we have and, and not very time efficient, but um, all of those would be available to help support you in your in your pursuit of the fellowship. Well, we hope that this has been informative on multiple levels, both for the North Carolina Reserve perspective, but also through the National Fellowship Program, and um, that this will provide some opportunity for you to mull over that opportunity and then connect with us about your project ideas. So I really just want to say thank you to all the staff for putting the time and energy and putting this together and for the follow-up office hour conversations. But um, also to all of you who took the time to join in today, it's really great to see to see you, meet you, um, share this information with you, and um, we hope that we have further conversations with a number of you about your project ideas. So really, thank you for your interest and your time today.